versus fuel is huge. And because people are really concerned about that. They say, well, we don't have enough food in the world. Why are you using it all to produce ethanol or biodiesel? And, um, and my answer to this one is, you know, ultimately, getting fuel from biomass makes a lot of sense. And I think it's a really important step. I view the food versus fuel as an intermediate step. What we're learning is we're learning the processes to convert biomass into fuel. We're learning the technologies. We're developing the technologies. Those technologies are already getting a lot more efficient there. At some point, we'll be using the waste part of the uh, plant as opposed to um, the, and get it right away from the food versus fuel. Organic versus traditional. Um, this is one that is some, to, to some extent philosophical, um, to some extent based on uh, there is no evidence that organic is any healthier, um, and so but some people perceive. I look at it as if you've got a market that wants organic and you can make decent money at that by doing it, that's a great thing. Um, but frankly, I don't see that as the solution to the world's problems because you actually need more land, more resources, and the more organic you go, I think some of the more challenges we'll get into if the entire um, sort of farming community is that. Uh, farm income versus investing in the future. This is my sort of policy. Uh, piece that I get a little uh, concerned about. I think we're putting way too much money into the, some of the business risk management programs that don't make as much sense, and we're putting way too little into the uh, long-term sort of future of the thing. So I'd like to see a little bit of a shift there, but I also recognize lots of times we need crop insurance because I think that provides real value. And when we see things like floods and uh, wet, really wet springs, I think it's important for the government to step in there. Um, and the last thing, farming practices, the way we actually farm, I was in the chicken business for 20 years, the way I ran my farm compared to the way people perceive chickens being grown um, probably was different. They probably didn't see thousands and thousands of birds in a bunch of large barns. Uh, and, and so, you know, I think we have to address that, inform people, and, uh, and, but actually things are going to change. You know, I don't know if you've seen some of the latest ads on the against the cage layers, but there are some very aggressive groups out there trying to change farming practices, and I think to some extent they will be successful. And so, you know, we're getting we're seeing changes in sizes for cages and so on for laying hands like that. Um, if you think about closer to home, how, there's a lot more interest in where food is, where it's coming from, um, and what's happening. And um, the traceability's come up a couple times in, in discussion already, uh, and I'll be talking a little bit about it, but I was on a, on a traceability forum panel with Jamie Kennedy, who's a, a famous chef, and he said he loved traceability because he said, I've got one that traces where the fish came from. He said, restaurants are part entertainment. And he said, I, if I can tell a story about my food, that increases the value of that, of that uh, item to the consumer and to me. And so he said, I love traceability for that reason. It's not about food safety for me. It's about tell, being able to tell an accurate story. Um, and so we're seeing bloggers. We're seeing all kinds of things. Um, interesting, Jason's point on he's getting a bit of a 100-mile diet for, for Horizon to some extent. Uh, I thought that was a very interesting one where, where, you know, the whole idea of trying to get everything close to home. Um, if the world did this, I'm not sure this would be a good thing for Saskatchewan um, because I'm not sure everybody can eat all the food that's produced here. And so, um, so I, I think it's, again, another interesting concept. To me, I just look for, I'm happy to buy, you know, local Ontario product, Canadian product. Those are sort of my close enough to home for me. I'm more of a national consumer, but it is a legitimate market. There's a lot of interest. There's an inordinate amount of money going into that right now um, for the size of the market. To get this, what we have to do is get better networks, distribution networks to move stuff from farms right into the cities. But right now, we don't have the appropriate networks to do that, so this is an underserved market for us. A uh, lot more focus on ethnic markets, and uh, for certainly in Ontario, where I'm from, we see a ton of that. And, and you're seeing around here a huge amount of work in specialty crops. So that's getting really interesting. Consumers are changing, and if you look around the room, we do not look like 
the Canadian profile of the Canadian consumer. We certainly don't look like the profile of a, a Toronto consumer. And so we need to have better connections into those markets um, so that we understand them better. And this applies both to domestic markets and to international markets. You really need to spend the time to get the relationships to understand what the consumers want. Some things about farming are the same as any other business. You need to know what your consumers want. You need to focus on them and you need to be consistent. You give them what they need all the time when they actually want it. Uh, this whole shape of things to come, while it's already here, and now we're hearing it's, it's in the dogs too, and, and pets. This uh, getting, we're getting fatter all the time, and that's not a good thing for us. Uh, that's not going to go away in the next little while. Uh, and actually, it gets quite scary if you start to look at some of the stats. Um, it's not just about the food side, it's about how, what, how inactive our lives are compared to what they used to be. And, and so we have to get a balance there. But there's a huge food piece to that. Um, and I was really interested to hear this kind of stuff that Mark's doing. A number of organizations are trying to do to actually uh, make their products healthier. This is a really, just a few slides from a, a study on obesity in Canada. So this was 1985, that's an obesity map of Canada, and the light pink says less than, fewer than 10% of Canadians were registered obese at that time. Every five years, we added a new, another 5% up. So uh, by 90, we had to add this 10 to 14. By 94, we had to add a 15 to 19. By 2000, we had to add an over 20%. By 2004, we had to add two more categories, 25 to 29 and over 30%. And we're slow compared to the US. If you go on to the US um, Center for Disease Control, they have one of these things, and it is just frightening. So that has big implications for us in the food business. And if you want to know how much it means, to governments. This is an estimate out of BC. And the top pink line is BC's estimate of the amount of money that they're going to spend on health care, growing at about 8% a year, which was their current. Um, and then they said if we can hold education spending at its current rate, which is about 3% a year growth, by 17, 2017, 2018, the amount that we, we would have left for every other BC provincial government uh, would be zero. Now, if you want to get a government's attention, zero dollars for everything they're already else that they're doing will do that. Uh, and, and so we need to address this whole issue, and we can be part of the solution. We can only be part of the solution, but so people are interested in what can you do in terms of that. Salt, another issue, so Campbell's Soup came up and uh, I do some work with them and, and Phil Dome, the president of Campbell, said he really started to become concerned about his food quality when A, they did a survey of their um, own employees and they didn't really, most employees didn't feel their food was healthy enough to, to serve to their families. He thought that was a bad sign. Um, and, then, uh, and then the second, he said, the second indicator to him was, he said, I was making soup at home I asked my son, who was in high school at the time, if he wanted some soup, and, and, and his son said, um, is it Campbell's? So Phil said, oh no, it's something else, it's a competitor's, of course. And he said, well, if it's Campbell's, my rowing coach said I shouldn't eat it, it's just not good enough for me, too much salt. Uh, so when you start to get from your employees and your family that your food isn't healthy, you know, that, that makes major change. They've recently come out with a, a product they call Nutritious that is really designed to have, be really healthy and really stable to go to the north and to, into disaster areas and so on. Food safety came up. Food safety is a big issue, um, whether you're in the meat business or in uh, the bean spout business. Um, this is a huge, huge thing. I, I'm amazed by these numbers from um, you know, public health agent in Canada. 11 to 13 million cases, they think, of foodborne illness a year. Uh, of over a billion dollars just in cost to us. So this is, a, this is a big deal. And, uh, and the thing about it is you don't have to be at fault to lose. You know, look at those cucumbers that were from Spain. Germany tagged them as the source of the E. coli. $300 million in losses later, they said, well, actually, it's the organic bean sprouts. Well, that would have been nice to know initially. And so one that means 
Uh, consumers do not like this, um, especially the death part, of course. But that's a disaster. And, and so they are not going to accept this for very long. So I think what we're going to see, first of all, better systems for food safety and really high expectations on farmers and food companies to, to, to do a lot in terms of everything in their power to make sure the food's safe. And then the second thing that they're going to, um, I think, expect is better technologies to test and faster technology so that this doesn't happen where they're floundering around Europe for two weeks trying to figure out where did this come from and why are we still making these poor people sick or actually killing people. It's just an unbelievable uh, human disaster. Like that is just, we can't do that. And so, um, how many people in the room have seen this one, Food Inc? You know, you should watch it. You may not agree with everything, but you should know how people, some people at least, are looking at your industry. It's important to, to, because, and some of the stuff that they have in there are some very interesting, kind of cool examples of different ways to approach the problem. And some of them are just sort of scary, this doesn't look very good kind of things. But you actually need to watch this because it is important to understand how people are looking at you so you can put yourself in their shoes and say, if the consumer is looking at what I'm doing and what we're doing, do they, A, understand what we're doing? And can I make that understandable? And, and can I convince them this is actually really good overall? That's important. Uh, we're seeing private standards. That's going to be a big part of the next 10 years. Stores setting their own standards, particularly retail stores. That's who drives it. But also the food companies, the McCain's. You're shipping to McCain's. You have to have very specific, meet very specific standards. We're seeing cooperatives of, uh, in Ontario, a lot, a lot of the produce cooperatives run by farmers have really strict standards that they want their people. If you want to ship to us, which is actually you, um, you have to meet these standards. And if you don't, you're out. Uh, you can still be part of an owner, and then we'll get rid of you at some point. But um, so that enforces quality, enforces traceability, it enforces food safety. So all of those things are important. One of the things that we want to be engaged in over the next decade is talking to the people who are making these standards and being part of the discussions. And this goes with regulations as well, and working with CFIA. Um, really have being in the discussion while it's happening as opposed to uh, just finding out later, though I've got to meet these standards. So when we look at traceability, we're going to have all of these things. You're going to have to identify your premise. We're moving pretty well on that, and, uh, certainly in some of the areas. Product identification, we're not bad on. We're, we're going to see this RFID being important, radio frequency identification, the little radio tags, and those will have read-write read, write capabilities, so you can put information on it as well as uh, pick up information from it. Um, we're really lousy at tracking things um, and knowing where they've been. That will change over the next little while. So all this is going to be important.